It is my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, uh, seminar speaker. So this is an IAS Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, Professor Hans Anderson from Stanford University. So let me first introduce a bit of our background of Hans. Uh, Hans was uh, born and grew up in New York City, uh, and then he went to MIT for both undergraduate and a PhD studies, and obtained his PhD in 1966. He was working with uh, uh, Erwin Oppenheim, you know, the, the, the master in thermodynamics and uh, statistical mechanics. Then Hans joined the Stanford University Department of Chemistry as assistant professor back in 1968, and then he stayed there ever since. He was promoted to a full professor in 1980, and in 1994 he was named as a David uh, Malvin Arsam and Edwin Curtis Franklin Professor in Chemistry. And now he was uh, uh, emeritus uh, the professor in chemistry department there. Uh, Hans was uh, elected to the US National Academy of Science in 1992, and he's also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and American Association for the Advancement of Science, and also a fellow of American Physical Society. So I think Hans is uh, uh, very famous for his work of applying the statistical mechanics to develop theoretical understanding of the structure and dynamics of liquid. This is what he's going to talk about. Uh, but before I, I hand the mic to uh, Hans, I want to highlight a few of his achievements. I think he was uh, uh, recognized as uh, in the Theoretical Chemistry Award uh, in the Theoretical and Experimental Chemistry of Liquids from the American Chemical Society in 1988. He also won the Theoretical Chemistry Award uh, in the uh, American Chemical Society in 2006. Uh, I think uh, 2006, I went to the, I attended the ASS national meeting to, uh, to the, listen to his uh, award lectures. And he actually talked about Markov state model that year. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, this is uh, Emily's work. And actually the, that sort of the, have influence on me and I started working on the Markov state model ever since then, 2006. So Hans has, uh, uh, has uh, made uh, significant contributions to the statistical mechanics and the molecular dynamic simulations. And he was uh, A in this uh, famous uh, WCA potential. And I, was, I checked the, uh, after lunch, I checked the citation. So that paper was published in the Journal of Chemical Physics back in 1971. That has been cited uh, 3,857 times for the WCA mm -hmm. potential. But, the, the most cited paper from Hans is uh, this uh, famous Anderson thermostat and uh, barostat. I think many of you do the uh, MD simulation. Either, either whether or not you use Gromax or NAMPS, you probably have the option of the choosing the Anderson thermostat. Uh, that was a paper published in Journal of Chemical Physics that has been cited nearly 5,000 times. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Hans. Uh, I like to talk about this method called multiple core screening uh, for doing molecular dynamic simulations. There are lots of ways, things to do with molecular dynamic simulations, but there are always things that are all too hard to be done right now. And the multi-scale core screening is designed to try to make a wider range of things possible given computers of any different uh, type of strength. So. Um, an outline of my talk is, first I want to talk, I want to, uh, talk about what, what I mean by all atom molecular dynamic simulations, just to make sure we're all on the same, uh, uh, we have the same understanding. Then I'll talk about multi-scale coarse graining molecular dynamics, which is an alternative that can extend the power of all, of all atom MD. Then I'll talk about two examples of the use of this MSCG simulation method. First, a relatively simple application to liquids of small molecules. It's still quite useful. But then we'll talk about a much more complex fluid, namely phospholipid bilayers in water. And then I'll say something about the prospects for the future of MSCG. Um, to, it, to, well, so starting all atom molecular dynamics, what do I mean by that? The first paper in all atom molecular dynamics was published about 50 years and six months ago by Lou Verlet. He entitled it Computer Experiments on Classical Fluids. But what he did would today be called All Atom Molecular Dynamic Simulations. Notice the word experiments is in quotes because there was nothing, no laboratory involved with this. It was all computer work. Uh, let me just quote a few, two sentences from the abstract. 
the equation of motion of a system of 864 particles interacting through a Leonard Jones potential has been integrated for various values of temperature and density. To a good approximation, the equilibrium state of argon can be described through a two-body potential. This paper was the first in a long series of uh, papers uh, that by, by many people the, the, who wanted to take advantage of the same idea. The basic idea is atoms are classical particles. They move according to classical dynamics. If you know the potential energy function that, that governs that motion, you can calculate how they'll behave as a function of time. And then you can uh, uh, solve the equations of motion numerically and come up with uh, uh, and, and, uh, and predict what the properties are. And what he found is that a very simple potential works for liquid argon. A few years ago, a few years after that, the same thing was done with, wa uh, with water. A water molecule is three particles, not one. And the, uh, uh, Stillinger and Raman wrote down a potential energy function, which is largely a guess, but it ended up giving us a model for water that was quite accurate. And since then, the, uh, there's a lot of, been a lot of effort to use exactly the same method to study small liquids, small molecule liquids, polymers, protein folding, all using the same idea. So all atom molecular dynamics then is a calculation in which the following things are done. You choose a specific set of a specific, uh, uh, of a specific number of molecules. Uh, so you uh, decide which molecules you're interested in, how many of them you're going you're to have. Every atom is regarded as a classical point particle. The potential energy of interaction for the atoms that you use is a smooth, realistic approximation to the exact interaction among the atoms. And then Newton's equations of motion for the positions and momentum of the particles are solved numerically. In the old days, we, in, in, in theoretical uh, uh, theory of liquids, we dealt a lot with formulas and approximations and trying to come up with simple expressions. Here, we're just using the brute force strength of a computer to numerically integrate Newton's equations and see how the, the atoms move. The procedure that's done is to start with each atom at a specific position with a specific momentum. Integrate the equations of motion until the system comes to equilibrium. And you may be surprised to hear that 869 particles can come to thermodynamic equilibrium, but they can. Continue integrating the equations of motion to collect information about the average structure and the fluctuations of that structure at equilibrium. So when you're doing all atom molecular dynamics, there are, there are some computational requirements. Uh, in particular, the computer time required is proportional to N T over S. N is the number of atoms. That is, the more atoms you have, the more computation you have to do. T is the physical time of the simulation. The longer the time you're trying to describe, the more computation you have to do. S is the intrinsic speed of the hardware. The larger the speed, the smaller the computer time required. And the constant of, pro the constant of proportionality depends upon the complexity of the liquid. So for example, in Verlet's calculation, he was dealing with 864, approximately 1,000 atoms. Each of his simulations was 15 picoseconds, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds. On the fastest computer he had available to him in 1966, it took one hour to do this calculation. It turns out an hour is 3.6 times 10 to the 2 seconds. And notice that the, at, that, uh, the atoms we're only going a very small time, but it took a long time to do it. In fact, the ratio of these two numbers is 10 to the 13th. So if you wanted to do, uh, uh, so, so the computer is much slower as a, as a uh, uh, is much slower than the atoms themselves are. The atoms are an analog computer in a sense. And they can get through 1.5 times uh, 10 to the minus 11 seconds in 1.5 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds. But the computer takes 10 to the 13 times as much computation. And this points out one of the real limitations on these calculations. Now, as in the last 50 years, the computer speed has increased uh, dramatically. And so uh, 
if you tried to do this calculation uh, today, it would take a lot less than an hour. However, as time goes on, we're interested in dealing with larger and larger systems, more and more atoms for longer and longer periods of time. And then we're sort of greedy. We aim for big problems. The net result is, despite a dramatic increase in the, in the computer uh, uh, speeds since the last 50 years, we can still think of problems that we can't solve right now in this way. So uh, today we... What am I doing? Okay. Today, we want to do calculations that involve much, much more than 864 particles for much longer times than 15 uh, uh, picoseconds. Existing computers are not sufficient to, uh, uh, for performing these calculations. So one way of getting around this problem is a procedure called coarse graining. And I'll focus on the multi-scale coarse graining method of Voth and coworkers, which was introduced in 2005. So that's the first part. Uh, I'll now, so now I talked about what I mean by all atom molecular dynamics. Now I'll talk about what multi-scale coarse graining thermodynamics is. The basic idea is of MSCG. Consider what features of a molecular system are most important for understanding the structure on very long time scales and long distance scales. Do you really need to know what every single atom is doing at all times and where it is uh, for this entire duration? Could you get by with less information? And the answer is you probably can. For example, uh, take a methanol molecule. This is a cartoon of a methanol molecule. This is a carbon atom, and here it's bonded to three hydrogen atoms at the end of these sticks. It's also bonded to an oxygen, which is bonded to a hydrogen up here. If you might say, well, I really don't need to know where these hydrogens are um, because they always stay near the carbons and this hydrogen stays near the oxygen. Maybe I could get by if I knew the center of mass of these two atoms, the hydroxyl group. That would be a point. And the center of mass of the methyl group would be another point. If I knew where this center of mass was and this center of mass was for all times, I'd know an awful lot about the structure of the liquid. I'd know about the orientation of the molecule. I'd know about where it is. That's less information than knowing about all of these things. And it may mean I can get by doing less computation since I'm asking for less information. Or you could say, well, I really only am interested in where this molecule is, so I might think about the center of mass of the entire molecule and say, then um, the, uh, if I knew where that center of mass is, I'd, be, uh, I'd have everything I needed to know. In this latter case, it's almost like treating the molecule as if it were a single atom with three coordinates, x, y, and z. The first way I talked about it is as if you're regarding the molecule as being something like a diatomic molecule, where this atom corresponds to a hydroxyl group and this atom corresponds to a methyl group. Or suppose I'm interested in a polypeptide. A polypeptide is a chain of amino acids, and each one of these boxes represents an amino acid with quite a few atoms in it. I don't need to know exactly where each of these atoms is to understand the shape of this polypeptide. If I knew, for example, the center of mass of this amino acid and the center of mass of this amino acid, I'm sorry, the location of the center of mass and the location of the center of mass of this. If you knew all this information, you would know how this protein was folded, and that might be all you needed. And so if you can figure out how to calculate the centers of mass without dealing with the individual atoms, that might give you all the information that you really need. So on each molecule of interest, you group the atoms into sets and focus on the center of mass of each set. Each such center of mass is referred to as a coarse grained site. The reason why it's a site is because you know its location. And so um, now you start, well, location, what is it? That's a point in space with an x, y, and z coordinate. Well, so regard each such site as the location of a coarse grained particle. So you imagine at the center of mass of a group that there's a particle we call the coarse grained particle. 
In the MSCG method, what you do is perform an all-atom molecular dynamics calculation of the type I talked about before, in which you're dealing with all the atoms. And you collect information about the forces on each coarse grain particle, that is, on the centers of mass of each of these groups, at each time in the atomic simulation. So you're gathering information about the forces on the coarse grain particles. Then you use that force information to construct a potential energy function for the centers of mass. This is the problematic thing. If you think about this, you'd wonder how would you go about doing it. But in fact, uh, Voth and uh, uh, made a guess as to how to do it, and it turned out to be right. And we'll call this potential the coarse grain potential. Then you perform molecular dynamics calculation that are much like the all atom ones, except you only have coarse grain particles, and you're using the coarse grain potential. The spelling here, potential, okay. Now, the number of coarse grain particles is less than the number of atoms, so this calculation is expected to be faster than the all atom simulation. So this is the basic idea of MSCG. And in the original version, an algorithm for calculating the coarse grain potential was, was presented. However, it's not clear that it was correct to, that it would be correct to use that potential for molecular dynamics of the CG particles. They guessed that that would be worthwhile, but it was just a guess. Nevertheless, when they applied it, it was, spark it was amazingly successful. And I remember when, when I first heard Greg Voth talk about this, uh, I was surprised that anything that looked so unreasonable as a guess could actually be that accurate. But in any case, uh, at that point, he and I started collaborating because he, he was interested in, 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 in uh, trying to develop a statistical mechanical understanding of what that potential actually was. And so uh, I uh, collaborated with his group, and we developed a rigorous statistical mechanical theory of the MSCG method. And the theory consisted of three parts, a theorem, a variational principle, and a set of algorithms. So the theorem is based on equilibrium classical statistical mechanics and asserts the following. The MSCG potential is well-defined for any liquid, provided the definitions of the coarse grain sites satisfy some very simple conditions. Second, the equilibrium structure obtained from a simulation of the CG particles that uses the CG potential is the same as what the AA simulation predicts for the centers of mass of the sets of atoms. It's as if, if we just use the, that CG potential, the centers of mass will, uh, will, will learn, uh, what we'll learn about the centers of mass is exactly what, we'll, what we'd learn about if we did the all atom simulation. Then we developed a variational principle for calculating approximations to that coarse grain potential and a set of algorithms using, the vari using this variational principle to calculate the MSCG potential. This is all described in a couple of papers. The first of them is right here. This, is, this was 2008, uh, and I collaborated uh, mostly with Will Noyd, and uh, uh, these other people contribute to, to the paper as well. Okay, so this, we have now a fully th uh, developed theoretical understanding. This is about four years after, three years after the original publication. And, but it, it clarified a number of things. It made it clear which properties of liquid can be calculated this way. And it turns out it's mainly structural properties uh, that can be calculated. Other things cannot be, although we're working on trying to extend that. The new, uh, this understanding led to the development of new algorithms for obtaining the MSCG potential. It led to an extension of the method to constant pressure simulations, uh, which uh, for those of you who, uh, that's a pretty technical statement, but if, if you, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you use both constant pressure as well as constant volume simulations, and this allowed an extension to, the, uh, to constant pressure. And the, this understanding showed how general the MSCG method really is. It was not clear how general it was, but it shows how it can be applied to very, very complex fluids. Moreover, the MSCG calculations 
are much more computation can be much more computationally efficient for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into in, in all that detail. The MSCG simulations can be much more efficient than all atom simulations, and we'll see example of this later in the talk. And this makes it possible, in some cases, to perform very long time simulations or on large numbers of CG particles that might, and these simulations might not be feasible for all atom simulations. Two things to be aware of. Uh, in practice, the MSCG potentials that we can calculate using the variation, variational principle are approximate rather than exact. So the theorem says that if we had the exact CG potential, we'd get exactly the right answer. We just hope that if we, can get, if we can get a good approximation to the potential, we'll get a good approximation to the right answer. But So before using an approximate MGC, MSCG potential, it's worthwhile to check its accuracy. And that's easy to do, as we'll discuss below. OK, so I've talked about the all atom simulations, uh, MSCG molecular dynamic simulations as an alternative that are sometimes much faster. And so for the rest of the time, I want to talk about two examples of the use of this method for to liquids of small molecules and then phospholipid bilayers in water. Okay, the first, the first example is a one-site model of methanol liquid. Suppose I decide, as we were talking about earlier, that if I, I'll mention liquid methanol, and all I'm really interested in knowing is where the methanol molecules are, that is, where the centers of mass are. So I want, that's like treating a methanol molecule as if it were a point particle or as if it were like a, 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 an atom. Uh, let's consider then a system of a certain number of methanol molecules at room temperature and pressure. We'll assign one CG site to the center of mass of each methanol molecule. So instead of six atoms for a molecule, we have one, uh, one coarse grain particle. The coarse grain liquid then is essentially like an atomic liquid. And by going through the MSCG calculation, we get the effective potential energy for that atomic liquid. Each coarse grain molecule has only three degrees of freedom. We perform, and for, so in order to do this, we perform an all atom simulation to get the, the data needed to calculate the MSCG potential. And then we perform a simulation of the coarse grain particles using the MSCG potential. And we use the same programs as we used for all atoms. We just have a different tensional energy function, a different set of masses, and a different number of particles. We don't have to rewrite the programs. Um, this, is a, uh, this shows uh, some of the uh, results. Uh, should, this is a G of R, otherwise known as a radial distribution function or a pair correlation function. And what it describes is the way molecules pa uh, pack around each other in the dense liquid we studied. We did it for room temperature methanol at normal uh, densities. So imagine you're sitting on top of the center of mass of one methanol molecule, and say that's at the origin. Nearby, the, and, and this axis represents uh, a distance away from the location of that atom. Nearby, there are no other centers of mass because the molecules repel each other very well. However, if you go about almost four angstroms away, there's a big peak. There's, there are a lot, there's a, you do find the centers of mass of neighboring mo uh, atom molecules. In fact, this peak corresponds to the mo a molecule that's hydrogen bonded to the molecule that's here. It's very narrow because there are only one or perhaps two hydrogen bonds that can form. Then there can be near neighbor molecules that are not hydrogen bonded, and that's this peak. And this is second neighbor peaks and so on. Now, the, uh, I don't know if you can see that these are red. The dashed lines are, I think, red. But I can, yeah, they're red. Uh, that's what we get from the coarse grain simulation. The, this, this, the, the, and this is a structural feature of the liquid that we got from this coarse grain simulation. The solid line is what you get from the all-atom situation. And the agreement is remarkably good. 
that's an indication that we have a very accurate CG potential. If we had a really inaccurate potential, we wouldn't get this kind of agreement. So this asks, that, that's a validation of the coarse grain potential. So we could go on to investigate very large systems of, uh, of, uh, of methanol and uh, be able to get the structural properties of that. We could also apply the same method to mixtures of liquids, even liquids near surfaces. There's a whole variety of, of problems we could solve, a deal with using this technique. OK, now, when you're doing coarse graining like this, you have a lot of freedom as to how you define the sites. We could have a two-site model of methanol, which is the first example I talked about. Imagine we assign a site to the, to the center of mass of the methyl group and one to the center of mass of the hydroxyl group. Now, the CG model is like a liquid of diatomic molecules. And all we have to do is simulate that. Well, to do that, we need to get the potential in the way, usual way, and then we perform the simulations on the MSCG model. Here's some more radial distribution function. This is a radial distribution function for the uh, if you're on the center of mass of one methyl atom, where are the centers of mass of the neighboring methyl, I'm sorry, on the, uh, if you're the center of mass of, the, of the, the methyl group of a molecule, where in the surroundings are the centers of mass of the other methyl groups? Well, if, uh, you're, if you're, uh, at the atom you're molecule you're concerned with is here, there are no centers of mass here, but this corresponds to uh, 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 a set of molecules that are, that are the first neighbors of uh, the molecules here. There's a, there's a dip here, and the second neighbors and third neighbors. Once again, the dashed line is what we get from the coarse grain simulation. The solid line is what we got from the all atom simulations. You can see the agreement is not perfect, but the features are all qualitatively correct, and quantitatively, they're not that bad. This is the kind of test you have to do. If these two curves were very different, uh, then that would indicate that our coarse grain potential is, uh, is not uh, accurate enough. But this, this looks pretty good. But there are other things we could look at as well. We could look at a methyl on one molecule and a hydroxyl on neighboring molecules. So if this is the center of mass of the methanol of the methyl group on one molecule, where are the surrounding hydroxyl groups? Turns out there are none at very small distances because of the repulsive forces. Then there is a peak here at about uh, um, three and a half angstroms, and a little sub-peak here, another peak, and so on. Um, in this case, the agreement is, is not as good. It's qualitatively correct. We get all the peaks, but some of the shapes are not quite right. This indicates that our coarse grain model is not perfect. However, it's, uh, this is a pretty good approximation, and the other two were, were, were rather good. So we've got a pretty accurate model, of a two-side model for methanol. And once again, then we could go on to investigate, uh, do simulations on much larger numbers of molecules uh, for much longer values of time. Um, Oh, and sorry, here's the, here's the same thing for the hydroxyl, hydroxyl. There's a hydroxyl on one molecule and the hydroxyl on the neighbor. Uh, there is a big first peak. We're getting the peak at the right location. Amplitude is a little bit off. The second peak, right location, amplitude is a little bit off. But on the whole, this is a reasonably good potential, coarse grain potential. Uh, and, and this is the way you test it. In the, ones I, in the examples that, I, that I'll talk about later on, the tests we do are going to be similar to this. They won't deal necessarily with radial distribution functions. But it's always worthwhile, if you've gone to the trouble of, in, of uh, calculating a coarse grain potential, validating to see how accurate it is by doing structural comparisons between what the coarse grain potential predicts and what the all-atom model predicts. OK. The, that's pretty straightforward small molecule stuff, although it could be very, very useful in some situations. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is phospholipid bilayers. And as, to get into that topic, let's uh, uh, consider the notion of a plasma membrane. 
living cells, in fact, cells in, in, in each, of, each of our bodies have uh, many examples of what's called a plasma membrane. Uh, this is a cartoon. Imagine that this is the, uh, that there is a cell, and this is one surface of the cell, and the cell looks like this. It's a big thing, and so here's a curve, uh, a flat curved surface. Um, so the cell might look something like this, and we're right on top here and looking at a slightly curved surface. And uh, what do we see? We see what looks like a sandwich. Uh, and I'll be talking about the structure of this later. But uh, these, these blue things represent what are called uh, phospholipids. These large things are proteins. That they're pro oh, first of all, this would correspond to the inside of the cell. This would correspond to the outside of the cell. One of the things the plasma membrane does is keeps the inside inside and keeps the outside outside. Then there can be channels that allow molecules or force molecules in or out, channels uh, that are uh, composed of proteins that are embedded in this uh, membrane. And there could be other molecules attached. Now suppose we just get rid of the proteins and get rid of the molecules that are attached. We get something that's uh, slightly simpler, but it's what's called a bilayer, a phospholipid bilayer. And here's a cartoon that, uh, that, uh, of what the structure looks like. On a molecular level, the, this phospholipid, this is something called uh, D, I've forgotten what it is, DOPC, yeah, I guess it is. It's a phosphatidylcholine. Up here, uh, there is a positively charged group. It's a positively charged nitrogen. It's like, uh, over here is a negatively charged group. It's a phosphate group. So you have positive group, negative group, and there's an ester linkage to a carbon atom. Uh, this carbon atom is one of three carbon atoms. That's like a glycerol molecule. It's a glycerol molecule in which this carbon has been esterified to this phosphoric acid, and this carbon atom, uh, atom has, a, has, a, has an ester linkage to a very long hydrocarbon chain. I've gotten how many carbon atoms there are. And this carbon atom is esterified to a very long hydrocarbon. Now, it turns out that when you have ionic groups, they like to be in water, and they are what's called hydrophilic. And it's the head, what's so-called head of the molecule, that's the hydrophobic part, that's this. Then these following are, are called tails, but those tails are hydrocarbons. They don't like to be in water. They want to be surrounded by other hydrocarbons. And so this is a hydrophobic, uh, uh, they're hydrophobic tails. So you've got molecules that are sort of uh, ambivalent. They don't know whether they want to be in water or they want to be uh, in, in hydrocarbon. In fact, part of it wants to be in water and part of it wants to be as far away from water as it can get. And the strategy for doing that is they organize themselves in the following way. You have head groups here, and the chains that are attached to it are sticking down. You have head groups here, and the chains attached to them are sticking up. So the hydrocarbon chains are all very happy because they're surrounded by hydrocarbon chains. The, hydro the hydrophilic groups with charge on them, they're happy too because they're in contact with the water. And this structure is remarkably stable. Uh, don't pay attention to these things. These actually represent cholesterol molecules because this figure was in, in, intended to be uh, uh, to show what that that many many membranes have cholesterol in them, as we'll see and as we're talk, uh, talking. But in any case, just think about the phospholipids, and this flat bilayer sheet is the basic structure of a biological membrane. So if you have the bilayer sheet and you add the proteins back and add the molecules or attach to the surface, that's what a cell membrane looks like. Also, the membrane around the nucleus of a cell has, uh, uh, the, the, uh, around the nucleus of the cell is a similar membrane uh, of this form. Um, so um, it turns out, oh, I should mention, suppose I take just these kinds of phospholipids and mix them with a little bit of water and shake them up. When it comes to equilibrium, they'll spontaneously form these bilayers. 
These are very stable systems, and they'll spontaneously form. If you have a high concentration of phospholipids uh, and not that much water, what you'll often find is one sheet like this and another sheet just like it above it. So you'll, here you'll have hydrocarbon, ions, some water above it, and then ions, hydrocarbons, water above it, and so on. You get stacks of these bilayers. Uh, and, uh, okay, so you get stacks of these bilayers, and that's easy to form when you just mix pure phospholipids with water itself. There's another structure you can get when you mix phospholipids with water, and that's what's called a vesicle. Uh, what it, it looks like a balloon, and in fact, imagine you've got a, a spherical, this is a cross-sectional cut, imagine you have a sphere um, spherical shell, and you have all these hydrophilic heads out here in contact with water. So you have water out here. You also have water in here. It's, uh, and uh, it's like a, a peach with a pit, except instead of a pit, it's just a, a cavity filled with water. Here, there are some, there are some hydrophilic uh, heads, and their chains are sticking inward. So it's like having a flat bilayer and wrapping it around in itself to get uh, a basketball or a football. Um, these also spontaneously form in the laboratory. If you were to take the phospholipid vesicles, the phospholipid bilayers, and, and sonicate them, uh, add a little water, you can, you can form these things. And they easily form with diameters of about 40 nanometers to about 200, 250 nanometers. Uh, and uh, so it's as if you've got a small sphere with this radius, a large sphere with this radius, and then in between, here's where the hydrocarbons go. Turns out that uh, phospholipid vesicles like this also exist in human cells and in living cells. And this, those vesicles are a lot like the, to, these things are a lot like the membranes, except they're, since they're so small, there's real curvature, them, curvature to them. But in the uh, plasma membrane, you have much, and typically much less curvature. So, uh, since these bilayer, since these phospholipids are so much like membranes. We thought, well, or not we thought, but many people have been studying uh, the developing models for lipid bilayers. And one of the first applications of the MSCG method was to develop a coarse grain model of, of, uh, of these phospholipids. Um, this is about the third paper of that type. They, the method got, was developed, and the, uh, uh, there are some interesting results in the first two papers, but this third paper, I think, is particularly important. Uh, it was a system in which DMPC, this is a phosphatidylcholine. It has the kind of head group we talked about on the previous slide, and it's got a, a, a different length of, uh, uh, of chain. Uh, DMPC, then, is the name of these molecules that have hydrophilic head groups and hydrophobic tails. Uh, in this case, the uh, system also has some cholesterol. So you have phospholipid and cholesterol together in water. Uh, what they developed was a 13-site model of DMPC. So here is the phospholipid. This is the charge head group for the nitrogen. This is the hard charged uh, head group uh, for the, uh, the, the, the phosphate. So these that one's a positive, one's negative, there's no net charge, but it wants to be in water. These are just the sites. Um, there are 13 sites for the molecule. There are about 120 atoms in the molecule, so it's as if each of these dots represent about 10 atoms. And here are the hydrocarbon chains, and up here are the, are the, are the, glycerol, uh, uh, the glycerol carbons. So this is a 13-site model of DMPC. And you might think, so this is only 10th as many particles. These, ca these calculations should be at least 10 times faster than the all-atom computations. And, but we'll see what the right answer is in a few minutes. 
the cholesterol molecule is, uh, has the structure of this uh, sort of greenish blue. You know, it's got these fused rings. And it's got about 70 atoms, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the coarse grain model treats it like a four site model. It's almost like a straight molecule with four atoms. Uh, uh, and that's what this model is. So this is four atoms, four sites rather than 70 atoms. In the other case, it was 13 sites rather than 120 atoms. And the results. First of all, uh, the, the first thing that they showed is uh, if you uh, do the all atom simulation, the bilayers are stable. And that's, that was certainly known. However, if you do the MSCG simulation, the bilayer is stable. So the, note, the idea of developing, we need a model of bilayers in which the bilayers are stable because this, they're stable in the, in the laboratory. And in fact, the MSCG uh, model with this 13 sites on one set of molecules and four on the other, it is in fact stable. The structure of the CG lipid bilayer was very similar to what is seen in the all atom simulation. And this is the test that shows that our coarse grain potential is correct. Now, the, the startling thing was the simulation of the MSCG model of the same size as for the all atom simulation was about a thousand times faster. Now, a thousand times increase in the power of your computer would be wonderful. But that's equivalent to what this is. If you are willing to give up some of the information and only get the information of the type we've been talking about, you can, uh, you, you can do your calculations a thousand times faster. And that enabled them to, go, to simulate a much larger version of the bilayer. And here's a, here's a picture of it. Uh, this is the all atom, result of the all atom, all atom simulation. And what is it you're looking at? This is uh, what's called a snapshot. It's not taking a photograph, but they know where, e at, a at one particular time, they know where every one, one of these coarse grain sites are, and each of these dots represents a coarse grain site. The dark green ones represent the, uh, the head groups. They like to be out near the water, and sure enough, that's where they are. Uh, also, this, this, okay, so this is the old atom one. This is a much... This is the much larger MSCG uh, sim uh, simulation they did. It had 225 times as many lipid molecules as this one does. Okay, so the head groups are out here. The, um, the yellow things are the hydrocarbon tails, here and here. And they're hard to see, but anything that's in the middle here that doesn't look like yellow or dark green is something like a blue. And it's the cholesterols. Turns out the cholesterols are lying straight, typically lying, lying uh, uh, perpendicular to the to the uh, surface. Uh, and but in any case, uh, this is what the the all atom system looks like, and this is what the MSCG model looks like. You should be aware that this is first of all this is the side view of it, and this is relatively small. This is the side view, and it's 15 times as deep. And that's why you're seeing more color and more dots here, because you're looking through at 50, uh, uh, something that's 15 times uh, uh, wider than this. So this is the kind of results, uh, what the, the picture of what the phospholipid looks like. And I left out one very important feature that's part of the reason uh, why the calculations went so fast. W the solvent, water, is not part of the coarse grain model. No sites were assigned to water. That means we don't have to integrate the equations of motion for the water. And you wonder, how can that work? Well, it turns out the fact that the water is there in the all atom simulation means that the coarse grain potential that we got has the effects of the water. The effect of the water on the phospholipid is built into the potential. But all we have to do to integrate the equation of motion is to integrate them for the coarse grain sites themselves. So getting, not having to do detailed calculations on all those water molecules is one of the reasons why we get a thousand-fold increase in the speed. Okay. <clears throat>
So not only is the, are the bilayers stable and, and in a good agreement with what the all atom system uh, has, the next thing they did is study li what about liposomes? So um, they did a uh, calculation uh, in which they, for they, they set up the structure of liposome, and that's um, that's roughly, roughly this. So there's water inside, water outside, and there's two layers of head groups, and in between are all the hydrocarbons. They set this up. In fact, it involves 12,000 of these uh, lipids, 12,000 cholesterols. Now, 12,000 uh, the, of these things, if you were doing an all-atom simulation, that would be about a million particles, a million atoms. So there's a million atoms in this system. And then this would be another, I don't know, 800,000 of them. So this is, only, this is about 3 million atoms if you were doing an all-atom system. But you're not. And if you're doing an all-atom system, you not only have these 3 million particles, you'd have all the water molecules it takes around it and in it. But all we have is uh, 13 times this number and, and 40 times this number, and that's about a few hundred thousand. And so that's, that's part of the reason for the, uh, for the speed. Now, this is 40 nanometers. In the laboratory, 40 nanometer vesicles are stable. And they took this uh, system and ran it for 40, uh, I'm sorry, 20 nanoseconds. T equals zero, 20 nanoseconds. You can see that there are some changes in shape. There are fluctuations in the shape, but the bilayer is still intact. The vesicle is still intact. That's what you would expect from experiment, and that's what the coarse grain model is consistent with. Uh, similarly, they, they set up a, something involving uh, now, what, about uh, almost eight times as many lipids. So we're dealing with the corresponding system here would be a, real, a huge number of, of, uh, of uh, atoms. Uh, they set up the bilayer. They ran for 20 nanoseconds, and the bilayer stayed round. So these, these, these vesicles are stable in the coarse grain model, which is reassuring because they're stable in the laboratory, and we want our theory to be good for describing what, uh, what's seen in the laboratory. Okay, uh, that was the, the first of some, of some uh, of the papers that I thought was really worthwhile to uh, discuss. Then later on, uh, uh, Voth with Srivastava made a couple of important extensions of the calculation. The, the lipids we've been talking about are, uh, were electrically neutral. They had positive and negative charges on it that canceled one another. But some lipids have charge on it, so they, they, made, they, they extended the technique to deal with that. But the other interesting thing that they did at first looked absurd, but here's what it is. Uh, well, okay, let me just say for what the system, what they studied was an aqueous lipid bilayer containing two different kinds of phospholipids. The phospholipid choline, the DOPC, is electrically neutral, with, but it's vitrionic with positive and negative charges on it. There's a net negative charge on the DOPS. This is a, this is a serine. Uh, then they did the all atom simulation involves 36 of these molecules and 36 of the other molecules and a large number of water molecules. Notice how small this number is compared to with, uh, but this is all it takes to do the all atom simulation to get the potential. Then in the MSCG model, they had a three site model for each lipid and again, no sites for the, for the solute. So here's, here's what their CG models look like. Um, it may not be easy to see here, but th th this is actually the head group. This is the middle group, and this is the tail. These represent the phosphates and the uh, uh, quaternary ammonium salts. Uh, and, the net, and the net, um, okay, this represents the, the first half of the chains, and this is the ha second half of the chains. It's like they're treating this 118-atom lipid as if it were a triatomic molecule. 
And it sounds like an absurd simplification at first, but it works as well or better than the previous one did. And so uh, now instead of dealing with 120 atoms, we're dealing with three. Uh, and um, they, they did simulations in which they set up small vesicles and they were stable, just like in the previous work. And they set up large vesicles and they were stable, just like in the previous work. And then they did this following very interesting uh, calculation. Imagine you had lipid bilayers and you rolled them over so that you had a tube. So here's at t equals zero, the tube from the side looks like this. If you look down through this, you're looking down through here. So you have water on the outside of this thing and you have water up through the middle of it. And they just started out this uh, structure and they wanted to see what happened. Um, and this has 39,125 lipids. Remember, there was only 35 or 36 lipids in, this in the all atom calculations that determined the potential. But we can now, given that potential, do these kinds of simulations uh, on this large uh, uh, model without much difficulty at all. So they started this at t equals zero. And what happened? Well, 20 nanoseconds later, one of the things you can see is they're beginning to lose some lipids on the outside. So the problem is that, uh, among other things, at the, end, at the end of the tube, you've got hydrocarbon chains in here that are in direct contact with water. And they don't really like that. They, um, you lose some of them, but they still stay attached because they don't want to be in water very much. But nevertheless, some of them go on to water. But notice that the shape is changing. It's as if the top, the top opening here is getting smaller. And the bottom opening is getting smaller. In fact, they may even be shut here. Uh, this thing is expanding outward. So it's changing its shape in two directions. It's trying to close this hole and this hole, and it's trying to develop curvature, okay? That's 20, after 150 seconds, it's spherical. It is like a liposome. So if you want to regard this as a liposome that's too long and has two holes, it's healed itself. So the, uh, these, 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 uh, uh, bilayers in water have a spontaneous, they not, if they're vesicles, they stay vesicles. If they're close to being vesicles, they will look like they will want to become vesicles and they'll do that if necessary. Okay, to summarize some of these results, the whole reason why we're doing this is we want a model for bilayers that describes what goes on in the laboratory, so we need to focus on that as well. And the reason why we're interested in it is that these, these uh, lipid bilayers are very much like biological membranes. So among the things we found is that flat coarse grain model bilayers are stable in the coarse grain simulation. But they're also stable in the laboratory. That's good. That means that the simulation method is giving answers that are likely to be in agreement with experiment. The coarse grain model liposomes are stable in the coarse grain simulation, and real liposomes are uh, stable in the laboratory as well. Moreover, the coarse grain bilayer tube just discussed spontaneously reconstructed itself to become an intact spherical liposome with no hydrophobic tails exposed in the water. And well, as we'll see, well, real li lipids in the laboratory spontaneously form spherical vesicles. They may not start as tubes, but they'll certainly spontaneously form spherical vesicles. Moreover, spherical vesicle and cell, uh, vesicles and cell membranes in cells undergo all sorts of shape transformations that are not that different from what was seen in the tube simulation just discussed. For example, uh, this is something I pulled off the web. Uh, there, there are two important properties of uh, things that have taken place in cells. It's called exocytosis and endocytosis. Exo means leaving, endo means entering. And I'm not sure what cytosis means, but in any case, 
Imagine that this region out here is at the outside of a cell, and here is the cell membrane. So this is the interior of the cell. However, in the interior of the cell, there might be a, some other thing like a nucleus or a membrane around this. So this is an internal membrane that encloses some parts of the cell, and this is the plasma membrane that's the external part. They're, that's, they, these are kind of complicated, but let's go through it this way. Uh, and in fact, it's hard to see it from the picture, but imagine you had a particle here on the outside, and, and, this is, and the system wants, the cell wants that particle. The way that gets in, apparently, is something like the following. This molecule will migrate to the surface of the phospholipid bio, of this uh, membrane. And when it gets to the surface, it'll sort of, the membrane will sort of uh, wrap around it and it'll be able to come into the cell. And as it's coming into the cell, it's getting wrapped around by this lipid bilayer. When this thing comes into the cell, it's in a vesicle. But you can see, in order for this to happen, you've got to cause breaks in the membrane here and here. And what somehow, the breaks form, but then they heal themselves. So by the time this thing comes in here, this membrane looks intact. And, uh, the, and, uh, well, and the phospholipids, uh, some of the phospholipids that were in the membrane have gone here, but you can now have, after it's all over, this will be a, a flat membrane. That's endocytosis. Exocytosis is the following. Sometimes in the cell, you've got vesicles with things in it, and the cell wants to release it into the surroundings. And what will happen is it'll move to the surface of the inside surface of the plasma membrane. And when it does that, it'll merge with the plasma membrane. An opening to the outside will take place. The contents will be released into the surroundings. And, the, and this vesicle, the phospholipids, will be incorporated into the bilayer. Nothing, another thing that's similar to that, suppose this is the nucleus, and something is going to be, leave the nucleus. The way it'll leave is by forming these kinds of uh, loops. The liquid will come in here. This thing will leave, and you can see that involves breaking the bilayers. It'll heal itself, and now I'll have this vesicle. And that's how the thing was in, got to be in the vesicle. So this is a way of getting something from, the, say, the nucleus to, the, to the, uh, other, uh, the, this part of the cell, and from this part of the cell to the surroundings. And it involves the formation of the vesicle and the rehealing of this membrane, the merging with this, the healing of it, and so on. These kinds of shape changes, you can, given the way the, that tube, uh, what happened with that tube, uh, it's easy to imagine that phospholipid bilayers and, and this coarse grain model for it could describe these kinds of events. Now, in cell division, a similar thing happens. I'll just talk about it briefly. When, when cells divide, they've got, you've got to get the chromosomes in the right places. And, you know, and after you do that, what happens is actin molecules start squeezing the cell. It's like you had a belt on and you tightened your belt. And this gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, this breaks and you have two cells. But it heals up, just like the healing in those, uh, in those uh, tubes, in that tube. So phosphate bilayers can act as flexible walls between two aqueous solutions, just like biological membranes. The spherical shape of phosphate bilayers is especially stable, just as in biological membranes. The thing that's different about the, this slide and the others, instead of talking uh, uh, the, uh, about uh, uh, lipid bilayers, uh, the, the model mimicking lipid bilayers, I'm saying that uh, uh, here I'm talking about biological membranes. So spherical shape of phospholipid layers is especially stable, just as in biological membranes. Significant distortion from the spherical shape is possible for phospholipid bilayers, just as in biological membranes. The MSCG models for phospholipid bilayers, just discussed, display these physical properties of real phospholipid bilayers. So um, 
the, la the, the last thing I want to talk about is a little bit about prospects of, for the future of MSCG. It's conceivable that the MSCG model of lipids can become the starting point for constructing coarse-grained models of biological membranes that reflect the chemical composition and molecular properties of the lipids and the chemical and ionic nature of molecules that are attached to the surface of the membrane. Um, to construct such coarse-grained models of cell membranes, we also need to construct highly coarse-grained models of the proteins that, at uh, that attach themselves to the membranes and or embed themselves in the membranes. But if we had good coarse-grained models of pr these proteins, and we probably have a reasonably good model for the phospholipids in membranes, we would then have uh, rather uh, efficient uh, the models, um, and we'd have models that would be easy to do simulations for that would, disc that would be uh, pertinent to many important properties of uh, processes in cells. It's not clear whether the MSCG method is the best way to, mo to model the proteins. Uh, but there are other methods that are being considered and developed by Voth and others to do this. And um, this is the, one of the directions that MSCG is, appears to be going in. So I'd like to... Uh, the, uh, acknowledge the, the people who I've worked with on this. There's Professor Greg Voth at the University of Chicago. He, he had, uh, came up with the original idea uh, for the coarse graining. Um, and uh, Abhisek Das was a graduate student of mine who uh, worked with us on this. Uh, the members of the Voth group, especially William Noyd, I worked with him on the develop, writing of the paper on the theory. Uh, Lan Wan Lu, I wrote on paper, uh, I worked with him on writing papers on the uh, algorithms. Aram Davtian, uh, I worked with him on publishing something I haven't talked about, but it, it was an attempt to you do MSCG uh, calculations that tells us, uh, gives us better results for the, the dynamic properties of, uh, of coarse grain models. Then uh, Sergei Izvikov and Anand Srivastava are the ones who did the two types of two simulations on on bilayer membranes that, uh, on, on bilayers that I, that I talked about. I had nothing to do with those experiments, but I thought that was an appropriate way uh, of appropriate example to, to to discuss to show the possible future of the MSCG method. Now my work in this area was supported by the National Science Foundation, and I thank them and I thank you for your attention. Question: You uh, start to talk about the example uh, methanol, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how about the simplest one, water? Also, oh you see, yeah, you just uh, one particle uh, to represent the three atoms. Okay, if you suppose, if, so uh, let's take the simplest case. Suppose you're you're dealing with pure water. If you have a one, uh, if you had a one center model of water, it would be a very bad model for water as a uh, uh, for water as a liquid. It just wouldn't have the right structure at all. Uh, I don't know if... Because of hydrogen bonds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. However, suppose you've got something dissolved in water, uh, and you then... But your coarse grain model does not have water in it. So you haven't even invented a, 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 one, a, a coarse grain model for the water. But as long as the water is there in the all-atom simulation with a good potential... It will, uh, it, 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 that will appear in the coarse grain potential for the solutes. So that would, a one side mod, so, um, no, I'm sorry, you're not going to do the one side, yeah. So with water, the best thing to do is to eliminate it from, from, the, uh, SB, from this, the model completely, if that's possible. And if it is the solvent, you typically want to get rid of that. But in general, if, if, the, if the behavior of the water molecule is really important and if the water appears in the coarse grain description, a, a one-site model is going to be a very poor representation and you just shouldn't do it. So um, I hope that answers your question. Now, you get into real problems. If you're interested in, say, how does a water molecule in a membrane, if it gets in there, how does it get through? That's a very interesting set of questions. But if you're doing the simulation with a lot of water molecules outside, you can't just sort of coarse grain one molecule and not coarse grain the uh, uh, coarse grain all these others out here and not coarse grain this molecule. So there are things you won't be able to do.
And so in particular, there are lots of things you can't do with this method when you, if you're interested in, in behavior of a single water molecule. For the math, no, you have a two-sided model, one-sided model. Seems for the one-sided model, looks like the fit into the pair correlation function is better than for the two-sided model, looks like. A, yeah, the, the, the one-sided model is, is a better representation uh, is, is, is a more accurate one than the two-sided model. That's right. Uh, and, and you're... You, well, for the two-sided, more accurate, actually, you have two parts, right? But for one side, it's just a whole thing, just represented by one particle, right? Oh, the, yeah. Well, first of all, when you're doing this, you have to decide what, what information you don't need, okay? And if you really needed to know, for example, it, it, that if you wanted your coarse grain model, to give you information about the orientation of the molecule, you just couldn't do the one-side model. So you'd have to have the two-side model. Uh, but if you're interested in other things, like uh, how far is the, is the molecule from the wall, from the wall or from a surface or from a big molecule, then if you only needed to know the center of mass, of uh, the location of the, of the center of mass of the molecule, then a single-side model would be, would be just fine. Yeah, just another naive question is, uh, you know, for the coarse graining, then uh, you eliminate a uh, you know, lot of internal degrees of freedom. Yeah. But then, but that that kind of degrees of freedom may have some effect in the uh, stabilization of structure, or something like entropy, right? And it, it, it no, somehow... that's not, that's it. it the, the entropic effects of of of, uh, of those neglected degrees of freedom is built into the potential that we're calculating. The, the, the thing that I've been calling the coarse grain potential is actually called a, a, a potential of mean force. And it has both entropic and, and energetic components. And that's built into it. It's like a free energy. Indeed. It's, like a, it's, like a more, it's more like a free energy than like a potential, but it is the right thing to use. should mention, you're, you're, you're right though, one of the things that you lose when you neglect these degrees of freedom is you lose the frictional force that they exert on the coarse grain particles, which means you don't get the dynamics of the coarse grain. Uh, the dynamics of the coarse grain uh, particles is not quite right, and we need to work on how to how to how to uh, deal with that. But uh, things move. When net result is that the coarse grain particles are don't feel that friction in this, that friction in the simulations that we do. The good side of that is that's why the calculations are faster. And so that, uh, that, 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 that helps. But, uh, but you can't necessarily trust, the, 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 say, the diffusion coefficients that you, you would get from MSCG. It's primarily structure that, 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 that the MSCG can account for. And it, account for its, it account for, accounts for it correctly, despite the fact that there is, it's both entropy and energy. It's all built into the, to the CG potential. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, so if I understand correctly, so it seems that in your uh, aqueous solution simulations, so basically you don't have explicit water model. So all this uh, water solvation effect are built into the potential, right? Well, yeah, because the, the you're, uh, you're interested in how the centers of mass right. move or what kind of structure they have. Yeah. In the all-atom simulation, the positions of those centers of mass are affected by the forces that the solvent molecules exert right, on right. them. Right. And so that potential contains the effect of the solvent. Right. So when you do the coarse grain simulation without the solvent, you'll get those effects. I see. Yes. Okay, so that means that, uh, for example, if I would like to change the temperature or I would like to change the density, yes. then you have to design a new potential, right? Right. If you okay, change so, the temperature... Yeah, then, I'm just curious, so how about the pH? So for example, if I would like to change the pH value of the solvation, then oh, it's yeah. the same thing and I have to redesign the potential or then I have to uh, build some cost grain model for this uh, hydronium or hydroxide. Okay, the real... Oh, yeah. The real, yeah, right. How do you change the pH? For example, you add, you, you add some base, okay? So you add some, say, potassium hydroxide, and the pH get, increases, okay? So now what do you have in your solution? You've got hydroxide ions, 
and you've got potassium ions. Okay? So instead of having water as the solvent, you have a solution of potassium hydroxide. Now, as long as you don't include the potassium and the hydroxide in the coarse grain model, they're just part of the solvent, and they go away. When it, and and, the, and the, you don't have to deal with them in the coarse grain model. But still, their effect, the forces that they exert on the degrees of freedom you keep, uh, are still there in the coarse grain potential. So, but, you, but it is true you have to do another calculation to get that potential, just as you'd have to make a new calculation if you change the temperature or the density. So it's the thermodynamics, if you change the thermodynamic state in any way, you've got to recalculate the potential. However, in this particular case, it's not a problem. Other questions? From Thank you for your talk. Um, my question, I think, is quite natural because uh, if you go from all atom models to coarse grain models, uh, that's one way. But what happens if you go the other way? Can you uh, take a coarse grain structure and uh, create a full atom structure from it? And well, I guess the answer probably is yes. So my question is, uh, how accurate are those models? Is there any perspective in that direction? Um, it's something that that a lot has been thought about, but I don't. And I think, um, I think someone has tried that, but I'm not sure it was with the MSCG. And in fact, it's a woman who works at, is it, is it Rice University? I think she has done things like this. But let me just give my answer to that. Uh, one of the things you might imagine doing, and I've, I've imagined it quite vividly, uh, because it might be useful, is you do the coarse graining, you, you run and let the system equilibrate, and then you try to convert that to a, a con con convert that coarse grain model uh, to an all atom model. The way you would do it in principle is uh, you would um, replace each coarse grain particle by its atoms in such a way that the center of mass of the atoms was right at the coarse grain particle. And you would do this for all of the coarse grain particles. Now, suppose you have a two-site model of something. And you've got uh, uh, the CH3 and the OH. Depending upon where you put them, they're not going to be very happy with regard to each other. So what you'd have to do is constrain the positions of the center of mass and do simulations to equilibrate these things. Okay, And if you did that, that might in fact give you, uh, in fact, in principle, it would give you a, uh, a, a good representation of the state of the liquid. How much, I'm not sure how much computation it would take to, to equilibrate each one of them. But so what you would do is you would, you would uh, uh, say, do a coarse grain simulation and say every 10 picoseconds or whatever, you would take the state and do that process, and then you could you could you might be able to then see how the overall structure was changing. Um, in fact, this might be a good way of equilibrating an, an all atom system that doesn't want to equilibrate. Uh, and uh, but there are going to be lots of situations in which people are going to want it. There are situations in which some people would want to do it. You, what you'd love to do is. Uh, something like do a coarse grain model of the entire system and then replace the coarse grain particles in a certain region like where chemical reaction is taking place and replace them by all the atoms and see what happens. So I'm sure that once we get big, big things like this growing, people will try to do what you're, do, what you're mentioning. Uh, how effective it will be, we won't know until we actually do it. But in principle, that's what you could do. Uh, but you can imagine that, uh, for example, you, this is the, if this is the methyl and this is the uh, hydroxyl, you might get them so intertwined that they might never get into the right shape. Um, and, and there may be other things around them that will keep that from happening. So it might, in fact, be very difficult to equilibrate. And you might have to do the equilibration in a different way. Well, thank you very much for the answer. <laughs> Uh, I have a question uh, about your membrane 
uh, uh, parallel simulation. Uh, and I have noticed that, that the, the system you have si simulated for your lipid system is as large as a tenth of nanometers. And I think this size has already reached a very big, uh, big, very big uh, scale. And I think at this scale, people have done a lot of work using the continuum, continuum model of membrane, and that is called the Herfrich membrane model. And the, I, I think people have done a lot of work uh, at this scale of, of membrane. And perhaps uh, we can combine the all atom sim simulation with the Herfrich membrane model to, 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 to compute for, for large memory systems. So, so uh, what do you think about uh, the multi-scale uh, cross-screening cross, cross and the continuum model of this scale? Or, uh, yes. The yeah, also. okay. Uh, again, this is something I have, I, if I understand correctly, uh, this is something I haven't thought about, but I know Greg Voth has, that um, the, you go from uh, atoms to coarse-grained particles. The next step up would be something like a continuum model or an elastic model. And can you go from the coarse grain to the elastic model in a reasonable way? Uh, is, that, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Or do I misunderstand you? Uh, I think we can directly combine the R atom simulation with the uh, elastic model. And I think uh, still, uh, uh, some people ha have already done some work in, in, in this way. So uh, this means that why we should, we, should, uh, we need to do the cost screening model uh, since we have already, already have uh, such ways of well, doing the, such things. The, the coarse grain model, I'm, I'm not sure what, there, there, first of all, there are a lot of approaches that are used to study bilayers. Yeah, and the, and uh, this is not going to replace all of them. The, the, there, are, there, they, there are some methods that use experimental data to parameterize the potentials. What this method uses is what we know of from, from small molecules about the interactions of the typical organic groups that appear in molecules with, with each other. So built into this is a lot of information about the actual forces between actual molecules. Not, not guesses, but pretty good approximations to it. Moreover, uh, you know, if, you have if you have different lipids, different lipids have different charges, slightly different shapes. And we're often interested in what happens when you replace one lipid by another type of lipid with different chemical properties, does this have any effect on the behavior of the membrane? That can be done with this, uh, with this approach. So uh, it, and the, uh, and maybe you're, you're, you're saying that they are, they are for, for different purposes. Uh, to calculate for calculate different uh, different kind of properties. Um, well, I'm not saying. Maybe I maybe I don't understand what what you're suggesting. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that directly combine the all atom simulation with the uh, elastic model. Right? With elastic, can you go directly from? Okay, okay. Maybe you want to go directly from an, an all atom simulation to an elastic model. Sure, if you can. If you can do that, that's fine. That makes sense uh, when you know that the material is, is elastic like a, like a uh, lipid bilayer. On the other hand, this is a method that isn't focusing, the MSCG method is more general than that. It can be applied to this situation, it can be applied to other situations as well. So it's worthwhile to at least try to see what you can do with, the, with this method. And if you can come up with something better, that's, that's fine. Uh, but finding the relationship between an atomistic representation and an elastic, rep continuum elastic representation, I can imagine doing that uh, in this particular case. But it's not the general situation, so that's not something that, that uh, we have focused on. Because we can have more discussions later. But let's take the last question before we move to the reception. We do have a reception after this, just right outside this room. Okay, let's take the... Uh, I have two small questions. The first is that uh, uh, here you use uh, lipid bilayer as uh, examples. 
uh, I'm wondering, can uh, can you apply this method to the protein protein uh, such as the protein folding problem? And the second question is, uh, what uh, what's the major difference between this method and uh, another well-known cost-screen model, the Martini uh, cost-screen model? Okay. Um, first question was again, which what was the first question? Uh, can we apply this method to the protein system? For example, the protein folding. Yeah, the, my, my impression that is that, that Greg has made a number of attempts. I haven't worked on this myself, but I've, I've heard, heard talks by numbers of students who have done this. Uh, uh, we're, the protein folding problem normally means you've got a real uh, formula for a real protein and you want to see what structure it folds into. And um, this method doesn't, has not been made to work for that. For that, you've got to go to these all atom simulations, like the ones that, uh, <clears throat> what's his name in New York? Uh, Shaw, Shaw, like Shaw, what Shaw does, and what, Vij what Vijay Pandey does. Uh, they're, we're interested, there. they're interested in getting the, getting the right structure. It involves a lot of, uh, a lot of simulation, and uh, it's hard to, con it's, uh, it's hard to develop accurate MSCG potentials for peptides. Part of the reason is, um, you saw what happened in the methanol case, or, or in the lipid bilayer case. You've got to come to equilibrium in order to, uh, in order to calculate the potential. But you don't know, you don't, you don't have the, you're trying to find the equilibrium state when you're doing protein folding calculations. So uh, it, it would be nice to develop, say, the, a potential for any pair of amino acids and say, now I've got the general theory of proteins. And so to run it and get the right answer. But, but that has not been done. And so, and, and that's part of what I meant when I said that uh, it's not clear the MSCG method is going to be useful for developing coarse grain models of, of proteins. Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But, but, or, uh, but in any case, uh, right now, uh, the protein folding problem as normally discussed, in other words, can you actually predict the right, stro the right structure for a protein from doing simulations? That's in the province of all atom right now. Okay, the second was, oh, th there are lots of different ways of doing coarse graining. Uh, the, among the important differences from my point of view bet, uh, between the different methods is what information is used. And there, there are some methods that use experimental information. Uh, and if, you're, uh, if you don't have a lot of experimental information, it's hard to, it's hard to, to construct the uh, model, so you might have to make guesses on, on some of the parameters. Here in the, in the MSCG method, what you're using is a whole body of experience for what the potentials between methyl groups are and ethyl groups, et cetera. Uh, we, we know a lot about small molecule interactions, organic interactions. And you know, if you have a very, very long hydrocarbon chain, the end of that is, looks like a very, I mean, has, is, is a, interacts with other things just like a short molecule does. We can easily make reasonably valid predictions of the way a long, uh, a very long, say, chain interacts with other things on the basis about what we know about smaller molecules. And that's what this thing does. It uses empirical information on interactions between small molecules to construct a potential for large molecules, which for biomolecular systems makes a lot of sense. It doesn't use ex experimental information at all. You don't need any. Uh, but but the information that it does provide is, uh, is physically correct or close to it, and that's what this method allows you to do. Okay, hey, so I think probably we have to close that section now, and then uh, we have reception outside, and uh, hope all of you will join with us for some coffee and, uh, and the slacks. And thanks, uh, Professor Anderson, again.